In the opening scene of the manga, a massive battle ensues as Sakuya's clan tries to steal the demon sword, but their mission fails. Yen, Sakuya's master, is left with the sixth demon sword, the only primordial sword that has not been destroyed. Yen wonders if they could save the ancient sword and the sixth demon sword, but she bids Sakuya farewell because she realizes that she won't make it. Sakuya notices that his master is dying and asks Yen if she's alright, but she tells him that according to her vision, he'll have to travel a thousand years in time into the world of magic. She also reveals that it was too late to stop the disaster that was coming, but he might be able to save the world of magic in the next 1,000 years. The day's events would repeat themselves in the kingdom of Freydale. Unfortunately, she's unable to see any farther into the future, so she gives him her sixth demon sword. She also asks him to destroy all the holy and magic swords in the next 1,000 years because she believes he can handle the sword's power without going out of control. Sakuya hesitates initially, but his master calls him a troublesome disciple, which forces him to assume responsibility for the sword. Shigura Sakuya promises to destroy all the holy and magic swords in the next 1,000 years before vanishing to another realm. Yen calls Sakuya her number one disciple. Meanwhile, Sakuya arrives in a strange world where he wonders whether he's in the kingdom of Freedale. Sakuya reveals that a catastrophe occurs once in a thousand years when all the ancient swords converge. Yen reveals that his ultimate goal is to stop the catastrophe, but for now, he's more concerned about making money. Sakuya shivers because he fears that he will find it easy to stop the calamity, but he decides to stop it regardless of what happens. Just then, Sakuya sees some thugs attempting to kidnap a woman and rushes to her rescue. One of the thugs calls him an empty-headed brat and tells him that he'll tear him into pieces. Just then, they hear some strange animal sounds, and the thug notices some monsters headed toward their direction, so he takes to his heels. Sakuya marvels at the strange creature because he has never seen anything like it, but he prepares to save the lady from incoming danger after noticing that the thugs have escaped. He grabs one of the swords that the thugs had left behind and thwacks the beasts mercilessly while wondering why they were so scared of them in the first place. After playing ping pong with the beast for a while, Sakuya realizes it's tough because it has three necks and a wide range of attacks. He walks toward the still tied up lady and asks her if she's fine, but she shouts out to him and asks him to look behind him. Sakuya realizes she is talking about the beast behind him and tells her he has already sliced it into pieces. Just when the lady was about to ask when he had killed the beast, someone called out her name and asked if she was okay. We discover that the name of the lady who had almost been abducted is Iris. Iris thanks Sakuya for his help, but Iris's butler asks Sakuya if he needs help with anything because he would love to return the favor. Sakuya refuses and turns to leave, but Iris's butler bursts into a crying fit because he believes that he has committed the grave sin of endangering his lord's life. He couldn't even thank his benefactor. Iris tries to calm him down, but her butler reveals that he thinks Sakuya would make a worthy ally. Iris chases after Sakuya and tries to call him back, but Sakuya refuses. He finally stops when Iris tells him that she has something important to tell him. Iris apologizes for not introducing herself earlier and reveals that she plans to attend the Magic Knight Academy in three days. She also tells him that it was for this very reason that she was looking for a bodyguard. She asks Sakuya if he can be her bodyguard and drops the gigantic bombshell that she's the princess of Freedale Kingdom. Sakuya wonders what she is doing in such a lonely place and asks her to find someone more qualified than him to protect her. He also introduces himself as Sakuya Shigure, and Iris's butler introduces himself as Barsh Edelhide. Iris tells Barsh to stop blaming himself because she was the one who had gotten lost while shopping. She also reveals that there were a lot of reasons why she needed someone like Sakuya as her bodyguard. Barsh tells Sakuya that incompetent old bodyguards like him shouldn't be allowed to serve the princess because people often attempt to capture the royalty. She would be better if she had a much younger and more able-bodied bodyguard. Sakuya tells them he can't do it because he has something urgent to do, but he suddenly realizes he will be getting free accommodation, so he agrees instantly. Barsh finds this suspicious and asks Sakuya why he suddenly changed his mind, but Sakuya turns in the opposite direction and suggests they leave. On getting to the front of Iris's mansion, Sakuya is surprised at how big the buildings in this world have gotten. He wonders if 1,000 years is long enough to warrant such a change, but his thoughts are interrupted by Luna Charlotte, who hugs Iris and tells her how she fears that she has lost her forever. Luna notices Sakuya and introduces herself as Sakuya's maid. Sakuya tells Luna that she'll be taking Sakuya as her bodyguard and leads him into the mansion, but he does not know the truth about Princess Iris. Later on, Sakuya enters a trance where he meets his master. Yen informs him that he has to destroy all the holy and magic swords because the holy swords contain the lives of the souls who had suffered from the calamity. She further reveals that they must wait for at least a thousand years 
before the souls are rescued. Just when the trance starts to fade, Sakuya asks his master where they are, but she reveals that her soul is trapped in the holy sword. Just then, Sakuya heard his master and the other lost souls as they cried out for help. The vision fades off, and Sakuya's resolve is strengthened. Sakuya recalls everything he'd read in the archives about the holy sword. His first discovery was that all the demon swords except the one with him had been destroyed, but two of the holy swords belonged to two of the knights of the holy rose who were in the kingdom of Greydale. He had also learned that he'd been transported in time to 997 years in the future, and it wouldn't be until the next three years before the great calamity occurred. Sakuya decides to devise a strategy to steal the holy swords, but realizes that he will probably get into a clash with the holy knights. He also realizes he couldn't ask Iris for help because he couldn't tell anyone his secret. Just then, Iris returned and remarked on how Sakuya had read late into the night. Sakuya smiles at this, hoping the princess won't notice what he is reading. Iris asks Sakuya if he knows she's going to school the next day. Just when the princess is about to strip, they're interrupted by Luna, who asks if it's true that Sakuya is from the east. Sakuya curses at this, but Iris turns to leave. After Iris walks out of hearing distance, Luna asks Sakuya if the princess has told him the truth. She also reveals that she is also a student of the academy. She asks Sakuya to keep Iris safe, and Sakuya calms her fears by jokingly about how Iris wouldn't want Luna to be her protector, but he quickly takes it back after noticing her facial expression. Princess Iris calls out Sakuya's name at that moment, and he promises Luna that he will keep the princess safe before running after her. Just before he leaves, Luna tells him to keep it a secret, but the princess has been smiling much lately since he arrived. Later on, Sakuya and Iris are seen heading toward the academy together. Sakuya asks Iris if they've arrived at the academy yet, but she tells him they're almost there. Sakuya marvels at the advanced technology in the future, alongside the mages flying in the sky, but Iris interrupts his train of thought as she informs him that his uniform looks nice on him. Sakuya is shocked at the sudden compliment and informs her that she looks cute. Sakuya cannot help himself as he stares at Iris's blonde hair against her school uniform. Sakuya tells Iris that she also looks more mature in her school uniform, but she's flustered at this, and Sakuya apologizes because he thinks he has offended her. Sakuya tells Iris that he didn't mean to offend her, but Iris apologizes and informs him that she isn't used to getting compliments from people aside from Barsh and Luna. Sakuya tells her he feels the same because he's more used to being alone. They suddenly realize that they were both used to being alone and not getting compliments from people. After they arrived at the academy, Sakuya was stunned at the sight of the magnificent building before them. Just then, people noticed Iris and Sakuya and made audible comments about how sinful it was that the cursed princess was in the academy. Iris chooses this moment to tell Sakuya how one of the famed demon swords had been sealed into her at birth. Sakuya apologizes and asks if the sword can be removed without damaging the body. Iris says she has never tried it before, but there should be a way around it. She also asks Sakuya to leave her if he's too scared, because others would try to kill her or abduct her. Sakuya realizes that this was probably what she was trying to tell him when she tried to strip in front of him the previous night, and he finally understands why Luna had asked if the princess told him her secret. Just then, a female student complains to her boyfriend about how terrified she is by Iris, but her boyfriend promises to take care of her if she wants. Sakuya informs Iris that he will stay by her side regardless of what happens, but he secretly promises himself that he will destroy all the ancient swords, even if he has to kill the princess to get the last one. As Sakuya and Iris make their way toward the main campus together, People gaze at them and wonder whether or not the renowned demon sword has enchanted Sakuya. Although one couple knows Sakuya is an escort, they call him the ideal scapegoat. However, Sakuya needs to pay more attention to them. Just then, Sakuya runs into an old acquaintance, Katrina Fontaine, who she introduces as an S-ranked holy sword wielder to Sakuya. It dawns on Sakuya that Katrina Fontaine is one of the knights he would have to fight to acquire one of the holy swords, and his eyes widen in awareness as he makes this assumption. The fact that Katrina was the eighth knight in the Order of the Holy Rose is another thing that she shares with Sakuya. On a later occasion, the school's headmaster addressed the institution's pupils and requested that they use their abilities to advance the institution. Additionally, he informs them that they will be ranked according to their powers and that only knights who have achieved the S rank will be eligible to become candidates for the Order of the Holy Sword. Sakuya smiles briefly as he realizes he can acquire the holy words to achieve the S rank. We learn that there are seven ranks, including the S, A, B, C, D, E, and F, but the S ranks are the most powerful. This information is revealed while Iris and Sakuya are having a conversation. Iris was ranked C because of her strong magic and weak combat skills, but she plans to get stronger. She assumes that Sakuya would most likely be ranked higher, given that he had so easily defeated the monster in the dungeon. However, they are taken aback when they find out that Sakuya is ranked F, the lowest rank of all knights. Iris is aware that this was most likely because Sakuya 
Takuya was unable to submit to any examinations because he had been enrolled on short notice. Nonetheless, Sakuya is not content with her rational reasoning because this has caused him a great deal of emotional distress. Because it would not be a good reflection on the princess if her escort were one of the students with the lowest ranking, he inquires about the possibility of retaking the examination or gaining a higher level. Sakuya assures him that he can increase his level whenever he wants. At that moment, Katrina intervenes and assumes that Sakuya is a level 2 knight. She believed she was the only person who could safeguard the princess. As she walks away, she bids them farewell and warns them to be cautious because the city is dangerous. After Katrina walks off, Iris informs Sakuya that contrary to people's opinion, Katrina is a very caring person. In addition, she discloses that the first time she met her was at a banquet hosted by a nobleman. On the other hand, Iris sees that Sakuya has been asking a lot of questions about Katrina, whom she refers to as Trina, and she asks Sakuya if he is in love with her Sakuya, and Sakuya tells her he is. Because she has flawless behavior and she's also a respectable knight, Iris is stunned by this revelation, and she asks him to stop giving her mixed signals because she had initially assumed that they had feelings for each other. At that precise moment, a teacher enters the classroom and requests that all students take their seats and get themselves settled for the lesson. They're surprised it's a small woman riding on a broomstick, and some even ask why a little kid who looks like a lollipop is teaching them. While Iris and Sakuya seem right with their new teacher's physique, their other classmates don't seem too excited about this. The small lady informs them that she's Rhea Teres, their homeroom teacher, and she'll also take them in some classes. She further revealed that magic classes would start after the necessary introductions. Later, Rhea Teres leads the students outside the class, teaching them how mana is an invisible power that can be transformed into real magic. She releases a gigantic fireball with nothing but a small sword, and the class assumes that using magic should be easy if a lady as small as Rhea can handle it. Sakuya is surprised by this as he recalls that people wielded powers without swords in the past, and those who used the holy swords had to have enough control of them. He asks Therese if her magic sword is similar to the holy swords, and she proudly admits that she had designed it herself. Sakuya gets more interested in the discussion and asks her to tell him about the magic swords, hoping she will say something about the holy swords. But to his surprise, she simply talks about how there are three types of swords in combat, and it is best to choose whichever is more suited to your capabilities, since short swords are the best for magic combat, while long swords are the best for melee combat, and the medium swords are good for everything in between. Therese asked the entire class to pick their swords, since she had brought a fine selection of magic swords for the entire class to pick from. Sakuya chooses to go with a long sword, since he's better at swordsmanship, while Iris picks a short sword, since she's better at using magic. After the entire class was done picking swords, Therese asked them to shoot their magic at the targets in the other direction. She also asks them to start with the beginner level fire magic fireball. Just then, Iris surprises the class by releasing a magnificent fire orb. Sakuya is amazed by how awesome Sakuya is, and he tells her that she's doing amazingly well. Just then, Katrina steps in and attempts to play target as well, but she stops stopped by Therese, who reveals that she will end up burning the school to the ground. Sakuya is mind blown by Katrina again, but he believes that Iris had performed not so far off herself and she could probably handle herself. Meanwhile, the other guys make snide remarks on how someone who wasn't good with magic could defend the princess, but they assume that since he got the job, he must be pretty good at it. Carl Astley, a rank A magic knight, tells the others that it's not unusual for the princess to buy a meat shield, and the others question where he came from since they had never heard of it before. Meanwhile, Sakuya attempts to cast a magic spell like Katrina's own, since casting a spell like that would mean that he wasn't too far from being an S rank knight. While Iris watches him, she sadly considers that only nobles have extraordinarily high magic power, so a person's magic power largely depends on their bloodline. After Sakuya wields his sword, he's unable to make fire come out. He attempts to do it repeatedly, but he apologizes to the princess because he can't get a fireball to come out no matter how hard he tries. He wonders how he would become an S-ranked knight if he couldn't even use magic. Carl and the other guys laugh at how crappy Sakuya's magic is, and they hit the nail on the head after saying Sakuya is no better than a commoner. Iris tries to cheer Sakuya up by telling him that magic isn't the only thing affecting the rankings, and he'll do better next time. Still, Sakuya couldn't help but wonder if the hidden demon sword he was carrying made it harder for him to use magic. He momentarily jubilates about this, but realizes that a demon sword is sealed inside Iris. Still, it didn't stop her from performing better than most, so this was probably because of his less-than-okay magic skills. They head toward the next class, which happens to be the swordsmanship class, 
with a new teacher named Will Walton. Walton tells them he's in charge of swordsmanship and magic swordsmanship, and Sakuya is in awe of him. Sakuya is stunned when he learns that Walton is the fourth rank of the Holy Rose Order, and he'll have to steal the magic sword from him. The class commences, and Will Walton tells the entire class that they'll be having a mock battle, and he'll be pairing them based on his selection. The other students feared a mock battle since they were unprepared, and most nobles were better at magic than swordsmanship. Will Walton goes through the list of students to choose who should fight first. He notices Katrina's name, but he decides to skip her since she's an S rank, and it is already pretty obvious that she is good at sword fighting. He calls Carl, the same guy who had mocked Sakuya earlier. He believes Carl would perform incredibly excellently since he is an A rank. For his opponent, he calls on Sakuya, who was the lowest ranked in the class. He promises Sakuya that he will give him a big boost in his assessment if he can beat Carl Astley, but since he is currently defending the princess, he assumes that he must be good at something. Sakuya agrees, but his feelings get hurt when Will Watson implies that he meant that as a joke. Meanwhile, the rest of the class discovers that Sakuya is a rank F magic knight and remarks how the pairing was hardly fair. Sakuya and Carl take a fighting stance and the rest of the class stares, wondering what a fine mess Carl would make of Sakuya. Walton informs them that they will use wooden swords, and only he will decide who wins. He also informs them that the only form of magic they would both be allowed to use is body enhancement magic, but Carl suddenly asks them to pause the impending battle. He heads out and returns with a piece of steel in the nick of time. The rest of the class shrieked at his superhuman body enhancement after Carl successfully twisted the hard piece of metal. He asks Sakuya to give up because he doesn't want to hurt him too badly, but Sakuya continues the battle. Iris cheers him on while telling him she'll be counting on him, but the others are too sure of what will happen next. Sakuya moves fast, and Carl jokes about how the only thing Sakuya is good at is running. After a while, the entire class watches in horror as it's pretty obvious who would win this match as Carl manages to lay a hit on Sakuya. While this occurs, Iris screams out Sakuya's name in horror. The class is surprised as Sakuya parries this hit, and his sword remains in perfect condition. Carl attacks Sakuya mercilessly, but Sakuya simply parries his hits and defends himself each time. It soon becomes clear what Sakuya is doing because Carl gets so weak that his body enhancement starts losing its strength and obstructing his ability to think clearly. Meanwhile, Sakuya continues to gain momentum and increase his strength. Carl gets irritated at how he is fighting an F rank, but he's the only one out of strength, so he decides to end things once and for all. Meanwhile, Sakuya recalls Iris's words about how the final evaluation highly depended on many factors, so he braces himself and considers the fastest way to end his opponent. Sakuya launches straight for Carl in one fast move, but Carl manages to get the first hit. Rather than being stopped by this, Will Walton is impressed, as Sakuya whoops Carl right when his body enhancement spell wears off through an indirect body enhancement. Will Watson realizes that Sakuya would easily be an S rank if judged by his fighting skills, so he declares him the winner. The others are surprised as Sakuya walks back to his seat with Carl Astley on the floor. Carl's friends call him an F ranked failure, but Carl calls out to Sakuya and asks him not to look at him disrespectfully. Will Watson walks up to Sakuya and tells him he is impressed at how Sakuya defeated Carl, even though he had no magical powers. Sakuya tells him that he was only lucky. Watson is not convinced of this, and he believes Sakuya could easily beat Watson in the real world when he finally learns how to use magic. Watson also promises that he will bump up Sakuya's evaluation later. Sakuya's classmates refuse to give him credit as they assume that Sakuya had won partly because of luck and because Carl was trying too hard to beat him. Iris and Katrina walk up to Sakuya and congratulate him on his win, but Katrina tells Sakuya that she'll need his help soon because she doesn't want to fall behind on her swordsmanship skills. Iris informs them that she has no plans to fall behind either, especially since being the princess meant she was the kingdom's protector. Iris and Katrina discuss how a wraith is tormenting the kingdom, and Sakuya asks if this is related to her complaints that the kingdom has been in a lot of danger recently. Their other classmates are stunned at how Sakuya is unaware of the phantom, and they even imply that he's irresponsible because the princess's bodyguard was the first person who was supposed to be aware of such information. Iris informs Sakuya that a strange entity, which people called a phantom, had recently begun to disturb the kingdom of Freedale and was responsible for the disappearance of some of the people of Freedale. She also calls it the darkness hiding in the kingdom, the monster of the hidden mist. Later on, three knights are seen walking down a dark street when they argue over which labyrinth to visit to fight monsters, but they're surprised by a dark shadow that suddenly covers them from behind. They take off running and are more alarmed when they discover it has almost caught up to them. The shadow drags two of the other knights, and the third knight, who appears to be the strongest, takes on a fighting stance, but he's no match for the wandering ghost, who happens to be the phantom. Meanwhile, Sakuya is a domineering boss, while Luna and Sakuya are asked to clean the house. 
After they are done with cleaning, Iris inspects the house and applauds them for making it look so beautiful. But then she proceeds to tell Sakuya how to swing the broom next time. Sakuya reveals that Iris reminds him of his master whenever she is being commanded. Iris suggests that since Sakuya is good at cleaning up, he'd be good with cooking, so she asks him to take control of the kitchen. But she's surprised when Sakuya makes way more food than necessary. Sakuya reveals that he's more accustomed to cooking war rations and excuses this by revealing that he's from a different part of the world. Luna informs Sakuya and Iris that she, alongside the other first-year students at the academy, will be visiting the Seventh Labyrinth. But she expresses fear because the cave houses monsters of all kinds. After going through the archives, Sakuya recalls what he learned about the Seventh Labyrinth. He recalls how the Seventh Labyrinth was one of the seven deadly labyrinths in the world, but it was by far the deadliest. Sakuya recalls that the chimera he had fought on the day he first met the princess was deadly, but it was on level three. However, since they were on a school expedition, they shouldn't be allowed to venture above the tenth level. Iris informs them they have nothing to worry about, since the Chimera usually appears above level 30. Just then, Luna informs them that some adventurers have recently gone missing in the Seventh Labyrinth, but they all hope there will be no case of disappearance again. Just then, Barsh, Iris's butler, steps into the room and informs Iris that her doctor is around. Iris appears to be terrified by this, but Luna and Sakuya accompany her. The doctor introduces himself as Belter Blanche and informs Sakuya that he'd heard so much about him and how he was a great escort for the princess despite his young age. Blanche also informs him that because of the demon sword sealed into Iris, she requires a checkup now and then to see if the demon sword is under control. Sakuya asks if the demon sword could go out of control because he realizes that it would be swallowed by dark energy and destroy the people of Freedale. But the doctor assures him that Iris has most of it under control. He also informs him that Iris uses very powerful magic called light magic to keep the sword under control. But he could use his magic sword to check if the sword is under control or not. If the magic energy radiating from the sword shows traces of dark energy or changes color, it would mean that the sword isn't stable. The doctor reassured Sakuya that the results would be ready soon. After a while, the doctor reveals that Iris has gained control over most of the sword. Meanwhile, Luna teases Sakuya Kuya about being relieved about the test results while implying that he has a crush on ease. Still, Sakuya doesn't tell Luna the truth about how he was only relieved because he wouldn't have to kill Iris anytime soon, and the fact that he might find a way to remove the sword without killing her. Dr. Blanche asks Sakuya to care for Iris in the Seventh Labyrinth before leaving. On the day of the Seventh Great Labyrinth exercise, Rhea Therese, Sakuya's small homeroom teacher, leads them to the guild, where they meet a large crowd of adventurers, but Carl calls it a pigsty. Sakuya remarks on how rude Carl Astley is, while explaining that the guild is where adventurers make money by embarking on a quest. Rhea Therese instructs the entire class to form a group of threes and visit the labyrinth. She further reveals a red diamond in the fifth level of the Seventh Great Labyrinth, and asks them to retrieve it. She further reveals that whichever group gets the diamond first and brings it back safely in six hours would be declared the winner. Rhea Therese addresses that no student had ever been killed on a trip to the Seventh Great Labyrinth. Carl calmly assures a female classmate that the monsters in level 10 and lower levels of the labyrinth are often weaker. However, Walton informs the students that they could still get disqualified at some point if they didn't follow the instructions. Rhea Therese also informs them that they were to use magic in case of dangerous situations, and she had put defensive magic in the robes she had given them earlier so Sakuya wouldn't get hurt. Walton asks the students to develop their group, and Katrina joins Sakuya and Iris's group while informing him of her plans to use a magic sword since she is confident in her swordsmanship. Sakuya tells her he'll look forward to seeing how a knight of the Holy Rose Order fights and they brace themselves for the battle ahead. Rhea Therese starts a countdown but the students run toward the labyrinth before she's done. Meanwhile, Carl informs his friends and teammates that he'll be leaving the battle in their hands, but they both promise him to do their best to ensure they win. Sakuya, Iris, and Katrina arrive at the first level of the labyrinth. She suggests that Iris help them find the stairs to the upper level so they avoid wasting energy or getting tired on their way back. Iris informs him that her experience with the labyrinth was useless here since the labyrinth was constantly changing its form. Iris also informs them that there are other things to watch out for, such as the death traps, and Sakuya realizes that the labyrinth has changed a lot since he last visited. Right when Iris warns them about monsters, they're attacked by fire snakes, which send a ball of fire their way. Iris tells Sakuya to get behind her and that she'll protect him with her magic, but Sakuya puts on a brave face and tells her to get behind him. Katrina tells them she'll deal with the body and leave the rest for them. She launches straight for the biggest snake and dissects it in a flurry of movement while revealing that she enjoys using magic. She prefers working with her sword. Sakuya is impressed by her swordsmanship skills, and Iris is next on his radar as she ends the other snake using ice magic while revealing that she could use any element to defeat an opponent, but ice worked best against the fire snake. Sakuya 
Julia tells Iris that he's impressed, but Iris reveals that the only monsters she's scared of are spiders, and as long as she doesn't see any of those, she's fine. They suddenly realize that the snakes have been waiting for them in front of the stairs, so they head up, hoping not to encounter spiders. They eventually arrive at the third level in the labyrinth, where they encounter the one creature that Princess Iris fears the most. Spiders! Princess Iris bursts into a crying fit and reveals that she cannot handle them, and Sakuya is stunned by how quickly she loses her bravado, but he rushes to her defense. Katrina asks Sakuya to defend the princess while she battles some spiders alone. Iris does a spider's thread, but the thread grabs Katrina's magic sword. Sakuya protects her and catches her before she falls while she defeats the spider. Katrina recovers from the shock of the attack and blushes furiously after Sakuya catches her, but she hurriedly picks herself up, which leads to Sakuya asking if she's okay. Katrina tells him she's okay, but Iris appears to be jealous as she thanks Sakuya for catching Katrina. Sakuya asks how Iris could expertly avoid the spider's webs, but Sakuya shuts down his insinuations by blaming it on luck. They decide to move fast before attracting more monsters. Two hours later, they arrive at the fifth level of the labyrinth, where Sakuya and Iris discover the glowing crystal. They jubilate about this, but Katrina reminds them that they still have a lot of monsters to defeat along the way, so they hurry up with dislodging the crystal. Sakuya thanks Katrina for her help, and Katrina asks him to stop calling her by her surname. She asks him to formally address her since they helped each other. Meanwhile, Iris gets jealous and invests her frustrations in cutting out the crystal. Sakuya asks if she's sulking, but she simply hands him the crystal while he apologizes for leaving all the hard work to her. They decide to get a move on as fast as possible. Sakuya walks ahead of them, but he doesn't notice the wraith that appears in front of him in time. Sakuya screams his name in horror, and Katrina joins her in assuming a fighting stance as she promises to rescue Sakuya no matter what. We soon discover that Sakuya has been teleported to a space full of monsters, where he runs into Carl Astley. Carl Astley Lastly brags about how he can enslave many monsters and asks Sakuya if he can achieve that on his own. He lets go of the monsters attacking Sakuya and promises to bow to Sakuya if he survives this experience. After Carl leaves, Sakuya fights monster after monster and even encounters a gigantic orc, which tries pummeling him into the ground. But luckily for him, he manages to dodge its attacks. He realizes that he has to meet up with the girls since they are supposed to return to the guild in six hours. Unfortunately, it appears that Sakuya would be stuck fighting these monsters for a long time as they regenerate. Sakuya realizes that conventional methods wouldn't be effective as the monsters would only regenerate. Still, Sakuya knows there is only one way around this, so he uses the demon sword while spinning it with high intensity for more destructive power. He ends up killing all the monsters simultaneously, and wonders if a weapon with necromancy skills could have been created in the next 1,000 years. He realizes that if such a thing had existed 1,000 years ago, his family might have found it easier to stop the great calamity from occurring. Just when Sakuya was about to leave, he heard his name and turned in that direction, but he was surprised to see a wandering spirit right before him. Meanwhile, Astley is seen striking some monsters while Iris and Sakuya are split up from the others. Iris tearfully suggests that they call for help because Sakuya can't use magic and he is more likely to die on his own. But Katrina says they can't find him unless they carry out a massive search for him. Katrina drags Iris off while telling her the princess's safety is their priority. She suggests they wait outside, but Katrina hopes Sakuya will survive because she had felt a murderous intent before Sakuya disappeared. She also reveals that she's unaware of what had been targeting him, but hopes he doesn't run into the wandering ghost. Meanwhile, the wandering ghost appears before Sakuya and asks him to come close Sakuya is surprised to see his dead master, and he asks if it's really her and why she was there. He also wonders whether or not he has the magic to bring back the dead. Just then, the ghost attacked Sakuya, and Sakuya was so stunned that he asked his master if she didn't recognize him. The demon sword slowly emerges from Sakuya's body, and he realizes it is reacting to his master. While taking a fighting stance, Sakuya realizes that she is using the same Shukichi technique and sword dance that only she could use. Sakuya asks if he can talk to her, but she simply informs him that she's his master and suggests they get on with their old training routine. The wandering spirit, which was currently disguised as his master, unveils a new form of shadow magic that has a dark energy surrounding it. But Sakuya decides that if it gets in the way of his mission, he will slay it. He apologizes before using an ancient technique on his master's clone. He tells her he hopes they meet again sometime before the wandering spirit fades off. Sakuya passes out from the exhaustion of the battle and falls into another trance. In this new trance, Sakuya wakes up in an old warehouse, where he's approached by a lady 
lady, Auntie Yen, whom we later discover to be his master. Yen scolds Sakuya for overworking himself and reveals that this wouldn't be the first time he sneaked away after dinner to practice all night. Sakuya tells Yen he plans to become stronger while making her his role model. Yen drags Sakuya for dinner while complaining that this would be the third time he has sneaked off to work out for an entire day. At the dinner table, Sakuya's close bond with his family is very evident as he engages in a food fight with Kennedy, his little sister. Their mom settles it by giving him her carrot, while Sakuya's dad replicates the favor by giving him his pumpkin. Sakuya's dad tells him he's proud of him for practicing all night, but his sister asks him not to flatter him too much for overexerting himself. But Sakuya's parents ignore her warnings while encouraging her to train hard. His mother even tells him she's envious because a competent and highly skilled woman of Yun's stature would be training him. Sakuya's parents overindulge them in eating, but afterward, they have a family match to burn the excess calories. Yen later approaches Sakuya to congratulate him for winning the family match. Sakuya's parents inform Yen and Sakuya that they're going on a mission, but Yen gets scared that they might not return, so she informs them that she's about to use her evil vision eye to look into the future. In the future, Yen sees that Sakuya's parents have succeeded in retrieving the demon swords, but an uncertain path lies ahead. She tries to probe further, but Sakuya's parents tell her not to worry because she worries too much. The episode ends as Sakuya's parents calm Yen's fears by telling her they'll hold a secret tea party after they arrive. What do you think happened next? Did Sakuya's parents survive? Why did Sakuya enter a trance from his past? And what will happen to the competition results? Find out in the next episode. The princess was seen crying because Sakuya had been trapped behind a wall. Princess Iris pleaded with Katrina to call for help, arguing that Sakuya couldn't use magic. However, Katrina responded that they couldn't call for help because they didn't know which floor Sakuya was on, and without casting a large-scale spell, they wouldn't be able to find him. Katrina grabbed Iris's hand and started pulling her away, insisting that they wait outside for the princess's safety was paramount. Despite Iris's pleas to wait, Katrina didn't listen. At that moment, Iris felt a mysterious killing intent and remembered the revenant they had to worry about. She hoped Shigur would be careful with the revenant, not knowing what he was after. Meanwhile, in the cave, Shigura faced a black fog monster, making him wonder if the fog was the revenant. Suddenly, the fog evolved into a familiar face under a hood. This face, with a slight grin, called out Shigur's name, shocking him as he realized the being looked exactly like his master. Lost in thought, he questioned what was happening and why his master, who was supposed to be dead, was there. He believed that magic to revive the dead couldn't be real. The being asked Sakuya to come closer as she drew her sword. Still lost in thought, Sakuya questioned the reality of the situation as the lady attacked him with a powerful sword strike. It was so swift that he couldn't follow with his eyes, realizing she was teleporting. He questioned how she could use teleportation. Then the magical sword sealed within him began to react, emerging from his chest. He wondered if the attacker was indeed his master, noting the resemblance and her high-speed movement and swordsmanship. Sakuya drew the magical sword from his chest and used a rewrite technique to battle the lady, eventually breaking her sword in two. He declared the battle over, addressing her as master, but she mocked him, suggesting they were merely practicing. As she took a fighting stance with a wicked laugh and conjured dark magic, shadowy snakes sprang up behind her, ready to attack. Sakuya realized she was nothing like his master, bracing himself with resolve and determination to defeat the monster, accepting that his master's return to life was too good to be true. Charging at the lady with lightning speed, he called her master, but quickly corrected himself, calling her a wandering ghost. He told her that if she stood in the way of his mission, he would have no choice but to cut her down. Aiming to slash her with his magical sword, she prepared to counter with her shadow snakes. To her shock, Sakuya vanished and reappeared behind her. He explained that he had applied her teleportation skill to his sword, apologizing for her poor display of skill before slashing her with his sword. As she vanished, she commended him, expressing hope that they would meet again, and then disappeared completely. Exhausted from the battle, Sakuya looked around, questioning if it was truly over and pondering the lady's identity. He fell to his knees, using his sword for support as he tried to stand, but his strength was waning. Gradually losing consciousness, he wondered if the fatigue from the battle was overwhelming him. His eyes grew heavy, and finally they closed, and he drifted into sleep, awakening within a dream in his unconscious state. In the dream, Sakuya's aunt Madoka was seen shouting his name, which shocked him and prompted him to ask if something was wrong. Aunt Madoka sharply replied, telling Sakuya that he lacked respect and reminding him that she had told him countless times to always address her as master. She then softened her tone, 
inquiring how long he had been in the training room. Sakuya responded that he had been there since dinner the previous day. The room, filled with broken sticks around a central target, represented Sakuya's many broken swords from practice. Aunt Madoka, visibly shocked and sweating, asked if he had been practicing all night, marking the third time he had been caught behaving similarly. Sakuya laughed heartily, his face blushing, as he explained that it was their family's duty to become stronger and prevent the apocalypse. He promised to work hard to become the strongest swordsman like her, his master. Aunt Madoka's expression changed to excitement as she smiled, running her hand through Sakuya's hair and advising him to take it one step at a time, warning that he could hurt himself if he overworked. Sakuya agreed with her. At breakfast time, Sakuya and his family gathered around the table. Sakuya and his sister, Keida, argued over a pumpkin, prompting their father to intervene, suggesting that Keida could have some of his pumpkin instead. Their mother offered her carrots if that was the cause of the dispute. Aunt Madoka interjected, saying Keida wasn't interested in carrots and didn't want to upset her by not eating them, so she was using Keida as an excuse to dispose of them. The conversation shifted when Sakuya's father mentioned hearing about Sakuya practicing alone all night. Sakuya confirmed with a loud laugh and his father expressed pride, calling him a genius. Aunt Madoka, disinterested, cautioned against flattering Sakuya too much, as it seemed to be going to his head. She warned that he was training excessively. Sakuya's mother chimed in, saying that having a swordsmanship teacher like Madoka was a rare opportunity, and she envied Sakuya for it. Keida, feeling jealous, stood up, declaring her intention to master their secret technique, lamenting that everything always revolved around her brother. Sakuya tried to calm her by offering pumpkin, which she refused in a childish huff. He then offered her meat, which immediately won her over. Their father, observing the exchange, thought to himself that Sakuya was cunning for bribing his sister with food and felt a twinge of sadness that his daughter shared his weakness for meat. He was content that his children got along so well, which reassured him and his wife as they prepared for their mission. Sakuya and Kaida asked their parents to bring back souvenirs upon their return. Their father inquired about their desires, to which Keita responded that she wished to eat yaokuns, the sparky and expensive variety served on a golden leaf. Their mother agreed, allowing it this time, but under the condition that they keep it a secret from the others. Both children jumped up in excitement. As they were preparing to go to bed, the older siblings approached Sakuya and Kaide, asking if they had finished eating and if they were interested in some exercise to aid digestion. They began their playful match, with Kaede suggesting they should all team up against brother Sakuya. That night, Sakuya was fast asleep in his bed, and Madoka, alone in his room, mused that he must have been exhausted, yet he still managed to outperform everyone, showcasing his rare talent. After closing his door, she retreated to a secluded space to use her future vision ability, the only thing she felt she could do. Images of faces flashed before her, and she saw that her siblings had managed to recover the demon sword. By then, she was weary. At that moment, Sakuya's parents entered, noticing Madoka's fatigue. They questioned if she had been using her magic eye of future vision, to which she confirmed. They expressed concern for her well-being, reminding her that pursuing the demon sword was no reason to risk her life by peering into the future. They urged her to take better care of herself, reminding her that she was the master of life and needed to look after Sakuya and the others. Sakuya's mother suggested they celebrate with tea and sweets upon their return from the mission in a few days, an idea Madoka found delightful. His father jokingly proposed adding alcohol to the celebration, but his wife sharply declined, and they all departed with smiles. In the next scene, Sakuya stood over two covered bodies on the ground, his expression one of shock. Sakuya stood in horror, his face a mask of shock as he gazed upon the two lifeless bodies before him. He feared they might be his parents. The family members gathered around murmured among themselves. Some couldn't accept that Sakuya's parents were dead, while others whispered that despite the tragedy, they had fulfilled their duty and brought no shame upon the family. They pondered the future of their clan in hushed tones. Madoka, visibly angry with herself, blamed her naivety for the calamity. She fought back tears, clutching her eye in a futile attempt to stem the flow. Sakuya, desperate for answers, interrupted her demanding to know the whereabouts of his parents and whether they had returned safely from their mission. With a show of bravery, Madoka knelt, grasping Sakuya's shoulders and implored him to listen. 
she revealed that his parents had been slain by a demon sword, a weapon misused by some to commit crimes and amass wealth at the expense of innocent lives. She explained that his parents had managed to retrieve the sword, but the victory was short-lived. The sword, fueled by the blood and malice of countless victims, had overwhelmed his mother's mind, driving her into a frenzy. In an attempt to halt her rampage, Sakuya's father had engaged her, leading to a tragic end where both fell by each other's hand. Sakuya, in denial and anger, rejected Madaka's words, insisting that his parents were well just the day before and the bodies before him were mere doubles. He was convinced that revealing their faces would prove they were imposters. In response, Madoka delivered a stern slap, urging him to face reality. She lamented that Sakuya had been coddled by the kindness of his brother and others, and she blamed herself for the events that unfolded. With urgency, she declared that they had no time to waste, as the apocalypse loomed a mere nine years away. Using her gift of foresight, Madoka peered into the future, indifferent to the cost of losing another nine years of her life. Through her visions, she saw the impending doom and proclaimed that it would be drawn forth by the Trinity. By then, Sakuya would have surpassed her as the family's greatest swordsman, destined to duel the wielder of the Trinity. With a calmer demeanor, Madoka informed Sakuya that his training would intensify, questioning whether he could endure the challenges ahead. Kneeling beside the bodies, Sakuya gently removed the coverings from their faces. Looking upon his deceased parents, he addressed them with a heavy heart, vowing to grow stronger, strong enough to make any demon sword quiver in fear. As he wiped away his tears, he turned to his master, pledging to do everything within his power to achieve their shared goal and to rise to any challenge she presented. Years passed and the training intensified. Sakuya and his master stood upon a hill, the sight of the impending final battle laid out before them. Sakuya confessed that the time spent training felt both endless and fleeting. His master, acknowledging him as her finest disciple, encouraged him with a fist bump, urging him to carve a path toward the future. Gratitude filled Sakuya as he thanked his master, crediting her for his resilience and ability to fight. It was then that he awoke from his dream in the cave, a sense of nostalgia washing over him. With renewed determination, he rose to his feet and began his journey outwards, ready to face what lay ahead. As he emerged from the cave, Princess Iris was in tears, relieved to see Sakuya unharmed and embracing him tightly. Katrina chimed in, mentioning that the princess had been worried sick during their escape. Sakuya apologized for causing them concern, admitting he was fortunate not to have gotten lost and to have escaped early, even if it meant breaking through a few walls. Princess Iris implored him not to overexert himself stressing that his presence was invaluable. As they walked, they encountered Astley and his two companions, with Astley wearing a scowl. Sakuya asked the girls to excuse him for a moment as he approached Astley. Astley taunted him, questioning how he survived the monster unscathed. Sakuya retorted that no trick was involved. He simply cut it down. He warned Astley that while he would overlook his actions this time, any future misdeeds would be met with consequences. Rejoining his friends, Sakuya apologized for the wait and handed a crystal to Iris, instructing her to give it to the teacher to complete their exercise. He expressed regret for their tardiness due to his detour. The girls reassured him that there was no need for apologies among friends. Upon presenting the crystal to the teacher, she verified its authenticity with her lens and congratulated the trio for passing the test, noting it was the quickest completion ever for a team with an S-rank member. Katrina suggested that Sakuya's performance was more impressive than hers, as he managed without magic despite some complications. This revelation concerned the teacher, prompting her to inquire about the incident. Sakuya, scratching his head, admitted that he had been separated from his teammates due to a trap, but had managed to rejoin them without further issues. The teacher, astonished, realized they could have finished even sooner if not for the mishap. She relayed Walton Sensei's praise of Sakuya's swordsmanship which led her to challenge him to a match. After several bouts, Sakuya remained undefeated, leaving the teacher slightly disheartened at her inability to match his skill. Sakuya complimented her solid fundamentals and graceful movements, expressing a desire to observe her battles more often. However, Walton Sensei interjected, reminding Sakuya of the importance of camaraderie with other students. Surrounding students mocked Sakuya, labeling him an F-rank swordsman whose victory over Astley was mere luck. The teacher who had sparred with Sakuya announced the end of the day's class, and he returned to his routine, 
unaware of the challenges ahead. The scene shifted dramatically as three giant guys seized Sakuya, and he realized, with a sense of disbelief, that he had been captured by muscular guys. The giant guys led him to a room, apologizing for startling him. The leader of the giants introduced the room as the club room of the Magic Swordsmanship Club, the base for conquering the Magic Knight Tournament. The one who introduced the room was the club president, who pleaded with Sakuya to join their club. He had been observing Sakuya in swordsmanship class and believed he was as skilled as the rumors suggested. He asked Sakuya to lend his power to the club to win the Magic Knight Tournament. A lady expressed her surprise, recognizing Sakuya as the talented freshman everyone had been talking about. Sakuya turned and recognized the lady as Luna Senpai. He asked if she was a member of the club, and she confirmed that she was the manager. The president was surprised that Luna and Sakuya already knew each other. Sakuya explained that they both worked for Princess Iris. Sakuya admitted that he was unfamiliar with the club activities and asked the president to explain. The president explained that the club studied magic swordsmanship, which combined swordsmanship and magic. Sakuya acknowledged that he had heard of it. The president emphasized that while it had been taught in class, the essence of it was pursued further in the club. He explained that magic knights fought using swords and magic to the fullest, showcasing the best of the best. The president declared that Sakuya would be a member of the club from then on because he wanted Sakuya to participate in the tournament. Sakuya protested, saying he wasn't good at magic, but the president reassured him. He explained that the club had three first-year talents, including Sakuya. If they all worked together, winning the championship wouldn't be a difficult task. He mentioned that one of the first years was even an S-rank. Sakuya wondered who the S-rank could be, suspecting there must be someone on the same level as Katrina San. Sakuya, not particularly interested, told the president that he was on guard duty. However, the president ignored him, using a brush soaked in ink to stamp Sakuya's finger on the club form. After this, the club members all welcomed him in unison. Princess Iris also joined the club as a manager. She told the president that Sakuya could participate in the club activities as long as she was around. The team members were happy, praising their president for recruiting three amazing talents. They declared it the birth of the golden generation. Sakuya examined his club application form, telling himself that he was just going along with the club and that it would help him reach the S rank. They agreed to throw a welcoming party for the new members. One of the members noticed Katrina and asked her where she had been. She replied that she had been there all along. Sakuya confirmed his suspicion that the S rank the president was talking about was Katrina. Katrina approached Shigur, telling him that he must cultivate his eyes to be good at anything and to pay more attention to magic swordsmanship. She challenged him to a mock battle, but he didn't respond. She then asked if anyone was interested in fighting her, stating that the rules were simple. Whoever lands the first hit with either a magic or physical attack wins. Some club members suggested Sakuya take her on, given his status as one of the big three. However, he replied that he didn't stand a chance against her. A short young girl named Monica Winter stepped forward, expressing her desire to challenge Katrina. Mocking Katrina, she accused her of playing a boring role and questioned the importance of her potential loss. Monica declared to Shigur that she would demonstrate what real magic swordplay was about and that Sakuya should feel honored. She referred to herself as the only gifted person from the first year. Katrina responded to Monica, inviting her to the stage for their fight. Monica asked Katrina if she would refrain from using her armor or magic sword, expressing concern about potential injuries. Katrina reassured her, stating that as a holy rosary knight, she didn't need such things to face a weak opponent. Monica seemed pleased with this, vowing to dethrone Katrina from her S-rank position. Iris, standing among the spectators, commented that the battle would be fierce, describing Katrina as a tosser and Monica as a reckless girl. The club president acted as the referee, giving the two girls the go-ahead to start the fight. The battle was intense from the very start. Monica used a large fireball against Katrina, which Katrina easily deflected with her ice shield. Monica then used scorching fire magic. Although Katrina dodged it easily, Monica quickly moved to another attack spot. Katrina commented on Monica's speed, to which Monica agreed, claiming she was faster than Katrina. Monica then attacked Katrina from a blind spot, thinking she had won. However, she was shocked to find that she had hit Katrina's water mirror instead of Katrina herself. At the same time, Katrina attacked Monica with a frozen ball, 
an offshoot of water magic, and sealed Monica's leg with her ice magic. Katrina declared the battle over, but to everyone's surprise, Monica forcibly pulled her leg out of the ice using physical enhancement, leaving her feet terribly bruised. She then launched a powerful fire attack at Katrina, called Explosive Ignition. Everyone thought Monica had won as Katrina didn't have the luxury of dodging the close-range attack. However, after the flames reduced, they saw Katrina emerge unscathed. Having used a dual magic technique called Protective Electric Field, which coated her body with blazing electricity. This lightning armor, combining offense and defense, is an S-rank magic. Sakuya was confused about the dual magic technique and asked Luna Senpai how the magic works. She explained that normal magic can only perform a single function, while dual magic is a more advanced form of magic. Sakuya was shocked to learn that Katrina had been working with such high-level magic. Katrina, now enveloped in an aura of electricity, touched Monica's thigh with her finger. Monica was fortunate to be wearing a robe that was resistant to electricity. Otherwise, she would have been immediately numbed by the touch. Monica fell helplessly to the ground, and the referee declared Katrina Fontaine the winner of the match. As Katrina walked away from the battleground, she turned and winked at Monica, suggesting they should fight again. She addressed Monica as Miss Winter, expressing that the match was quite thrilling. Monica smiled back, confidently stating that she would win next time. Katrina then turned her attention to Sakuya, indicating that it was time to start his club activities. They would begin with Monica casting a magic spell on Sakuya to help him get accustomed to the sensation of magic and learn how to control the movement of magic within his body. Monica then cast a physical enhancement spell on Sakuya and asked him to swing his sword. Feeling powerful and invigorated after the spell, Sakuya swung his sword, only for it to break into two. The group was shocked that the magic sword had broken. Monica lightened the mood, suggesting that the magic sword was already damaged and handed Sakuya a better sword. However, when Sakuya swung the new sword, it also broke, astonishing everyone. Monica found Sakuya intriguing and suggested he visit a blacksmith to get a custom magic sword. She explained that magic swords are designed for better accuracy and efficiency of magic, but in Sakuya's case, he would need one with better durability. Physical Enhancement is a magic spell designed to increase someone's magic by a factor of two. Iris was proud that her escort was so powerful. Iris and Sakuya then visited Glenn, the blacksmith, to request a custom-made magic sword with better durability. Glenn was surprised, but after examining Sakuya's palm, she noted that his palms were well-trained, like steel, indicating that his body was well-trained like a knight of the past. Glenn agreed to make a custom sword for Sakuya and asked him to return in a few days. As Iris and Sakuya left the blacksmith's workshop, Iris revealed that the reason the magic swords kept breaking was because Sakuya was fundamentally unfit for magic swords. This statement shocked Sakuya, leaving him wondering if Iris knew his secret. Sakuya was observed holding a jotter. After examining it for a while, he deduced that it must belong to the princess. The princess's doctor was present, packing her medicine. From the doctor's conversation, Sakuya inferred that the doctor had been with the princess for a long time. The doctor mentioned that Princess Iris's condition seemed far more stable than it had been in the past and promised to return when the medicine wore off. Sakuya, judging from his interaction with the doctor, wondered if the doctor might be aware of something concealed within her. He summoned the courage to ask the doctor, who responded that he could certainly tell him about her past. However, out of curiosity, the doctor wanted to know why Sakuya was asking, as he was sure it wouldn't be an interesting subject for him. Sakuya responded that he needed to know as someone who had been by her side and would continue to be. The doctor, giving a faint smile, replied that it seemed the princess had found an excellent man to protect her. He then told Sakuya about the princess's past. Iris was born as a saint, a child with a gift of light, a miracle that happens once in a century. This birth would normally be celebrated, but because her mother was a maid in the royal castle, she was an illegitimate daughter of King Friedel. She was unloved by everyone, including her father. As a result, the miraculous saint was used as an object to seal the cursed sword. However, the sealing failed. She was not just an illegitimate child, but also a disgrace to the entire country. The doctor explained that a cursed sword could possess a human body, but it couldn't possess the princess. Because of the failure of the seal, she had now become one with the cursed sword, making her the princess of the cursed sword. 
Because of this, she couldn't even go to school due to the danger of running amok. The princess was isolated in her own mansion with only a single old butler and a maid who would die alongside her. It was because of these people that the princess could gradually recover. The doctor mentioned that the reason why the princess had been smiling so much in the past few days was because of Sakuya. Knowing that he was being teased, Sakuya denied it. The doctor told him that he would like it if Sakuya continued to support the princess as much as he could. He mentioned that, since he had been attending to her, she had never smiled as much as she did when Sakuya was around. Before Sakuya arrived, she was always worn down and depressed. After the doctor left, Sakuya was seen examining Iris's notepad more closely. He thought to himself that Princess Iris should have hidden the notepad, which was full of embarrassing writing, a little better. He then noticed the butler talking with someone who looked like Astley. He went to ask the butler about it. The old man replied that he had seen Astley wandering around the castle, which is why he had called him out. However, he wasn't sure what to make of it. They both wondered if Astley was trying to kidnap Iris. At night, Sakuya was seen soaking himself in a pool, enjoying a relaxing bath. He thought to himself that there had been too many things on his mind lately, and the bath was the only relaxing time he had. Suddenly, he heard Luna's voice shouting that Iris had been snacking on his food again. Iris barged into the bathroom, almost naked, begging Sakuya to let her hide in his bath. She said that Luna was after her and that she knew Luna wouldn't come into the men's bath. She didn't want to get spanked 100 more times, so she jumped into the bath. Sakuya heard Luna raging about how she would punish Iris when she finally caught up with her. From the bathtub, Sakuya's voice echoed loud enough for Luna to hear. He confessed to being the one who had eaten all the food, mistakenly thinking it was leftovers, and assured Luna that Iris was innocent. Apologizing for his mistake, he received a forgiving response from Luna, who acknowledged Sakuya's consistent kindness towards her and decided to let him off the hook this time. Iris expressed her gratitude to Sakuya for taking the blame, and they engaged in a conversation about the novels Iris had been reading. To Iris' surprise, Sakuya even cracked a few jokes. The scene then shifted to Sakuya heading towards the mansion, balancing groceries on his head. Suddenly, he was intercepted by Astley and his gang. With a sinister grin, Astley suggested they step aside for a chat. He questioned them about their involvement in the black fog in the tower and accused them of being responsible for the wandering ghosts. Astley and his men then surrounded Sakuya with a magical wall, indicating that this confrontation wouldn't be a simple sword fight that Sakuya could easily win. Astley launched a powerful magical attack while Sakuya was still trapped within the prison, shattering the four-sided ice prison wall. Sakuya managed to deflect the remnants of Astley's attack with his sword and complimented Astley on his impressive magic. He admitted that if he had taken a direct hit from the attack, he would have been killed. Astley confessed that he had been having nightmares about Sakuya, which is why he felt compelled to kill him. Astley then unleashed a powerful triple magic technique known as the Hand Palm of Ice which covered the entire area with a giant palm of ice. Astley's men were shocked by the display of such potent magic and fled, fearing they would die if they stayed. Unfazed by his friend's desertion, Astley faced Sakuya, vowing to kill him both here and in his dreams, where Sakuya had always emerged victorious in their confrontations, and while they were fighting, an unknown man managed to kidnap the princess. Sakuya drew his sword, ready to fight, and charged at Astley. However, he was surrounded by giant arms of ice. Sakuya carefully looked for an opening, and then, using a single-point breakthrough attack, he closed the distance between them, ready to strike Astley. But Astley grabbed Sakuya's sword from behind with a giant palm of ice and broke the sword into two, mocking him. He taunted Sakuya, asking how he would fight back with a broken sword, stating it was a glaring weakness of the Magic Knight because they couldn't fight with a broken sword. Suddenly, Sakuya defeated Astley leaving him lying on the ground, defeated. Astley couldn't believe that Sakuya had defeated him with a broken sword. He admitted that he was fooled because he never thought Sakuya would be able to recreate the feeling of cutting through ice. Sakuya smiled at Astley, saying that it was a close call and commending him for a job well done. Astley, lying on the ground too tired to stand up, admitted that he had lost again and that honestly, this time he didn't care. He had a smile on his face because he had given his all. After the two boys had fought to their heart's content, they became somewhat of friends. Sakuya carried Astley on his back to the mansion to get some rest. But upon entering the mansion, Sakuya was shocked to see Luna-senpai lying on the ground, unconscious and barely breathing. 
He headed to Iris's room, but she wasn't there. He looked at the point of entry into the mansion and concluded that the kidnapper of the princess was a mastermind who had even used Astley to distract him. He was angry at himself for leaving the princess for even a moment as he said to himself that the princess had always been safe with him until he left her side. He then thought to himself that it was not far-fetched that other people, apart from him, were interested in the demon sword inside the princess's body. The most common way to retrieve a demon sword is to kill its owner. He took a blanket to roll Astley up and tied him using a rope to the bed, laying the unconscious Luna on the other bed. He didn't know what Astley was up to and thought there was a chance that Astley might be part of the kidnapping. He started pursuing the trail of the kidnappers and, upon stepping out, he was surrounded by revenant monsters. He wondered if it was the doing of the mastermind. At the same time, the revenant monsters appeared all over town, attacking people, causing the government to issue an emergency alert for the citizens to evacuate the capital while the knights were left to deal with them. He then realized that these monsters were the minions of the mastermind, also known as wandering ghosts. However, his master, whom he faced in the tower, was not a wandering ghost. He wanted to use the demon sword within him to defeat the monsters, but he knew that if he pulled it out, his secrets might be revealed. Therefore, he defeated the monsters using his sword skills combined with magic, as physical attacks wouldn't work on the wandering ghosts. Having been taught how to use some magic from the club, he was able to control the flow of magic in his body, thereby defeating the monsters. Afterwards, the ghosts of his family appeared to him, taunting him about how he had killed them and guilt-tripping him. They asked if he enjoyed swinging the swing so much, which made him realize that just like his master in the tower, they were wandering ghosts too. However, they were copied from his memories, making him realize that the true power of the mastermind is to use someone's worst nightmare against them. He fought back against the ghosts of his family, but hesitated when he was about to defeat them. As they taunted him more and prepared to fight him off, he summoned the courage to finish them off. He then chased the lead at high speed until he met Princess Iris's old man butler. The old man told him with a devilish expression that he had been expecting him for a while. Sakuya drew his sword, ready to attack the old man. He swung his sword at the man's neck, causing him to lose his balance and fall to the ground. The man pleaded with Sakuya not to attack him so suddenly. Sakuya responded, stating that the man's appearance was suspicious and he suspected the old man was an accomplice to the mastermind. The old man clarified that Sakuya had misunderstood him. He was merely waiting as a guide, and the real culprit was the primordial swordsman. He admitted that he was no match for such an opponent. With a worried expression, the old man told Sakuya that he was their last hope of saving the princess. A wandering ghost appeared, which the old man said he would handle, instructing Shigur to proceed. He explained that the scenes from before were all a disguise set up by the mastermind, and the real culprit was up ahead. The old man promised to provide an explanation once everything was over and begged Sakuya to save Iris. Sakuya agreed and sprinted forward, entering a building that resembled a church. As he walked in the building, he thought to himself that his mission was to prevent a great disaster three years from now. That's why he was guarding the princess. He had prepared for whatever he might do to the princess as a result. He reminded himself that it wasn't his level of preparedness that motivated him, but the question the princess had previously asked about whether it was okay if she lived. He needed the princess back to answer that question. He located the kidnapper, who was the princess's doctor, sitting and dining with the princess tied to a cross in front of him. The doctor asked how Sakuya had killed the Astley guy and used the question as a cover to launch a fast sneak attack on Sakuya, which he managed to dodge. The doctor expressed his admiration stating that he shouldn't expect anything less from the princess's guard who had defeated Astley, the wandering ghost. The doctor asked how Sakuya knew he was the mastermind. Sakuya replied that it was quite simple. The mastermind must know the structure of the mansion and must have a cursed sword. Only the doctor, Luna, and Bart met these requirements. Seeing that Luna was injured and Bart was fighting the wandering ghosts, that left only him. He also pointed out other places where the doctor had left loose ends, confirming his suspicion that the doctor was the mastermind. Sakuya considered using his demon sword because if the doctor used his demon sword, he would be able to take control of the entire space. But he knew using his demon sword carried the risk of being discovered by the knight. So Sakuya asked the doctor what he was trying to accomplish with the princess's demon sword. The doctor, picking up a tiny knife from the floor, said that he had a disease that he would like to cure. 
It was at this moment that Sakuya realized that the doctor's cursed sword had been drawn right from the beginning of time. Sakuya now understands why the doctor is so relaxed after finishing his meal of wine and meat. The doctor has unsheathed his cursed sword, indicating that he could kill Sakuya at any moment. From the doctor's blind spot, Sakuya launched an attack, but the doctor defended himself using his small cursed knife. He claimed that he could see everything, including the fear in Sakuya's eyes, which encompassed expressions of threat, anxiety, and fear. Sakuya's sword was damaged merely by touching the doctor's cursed sword, leading Sakuya to realize the immense power of a cursed sword. However, this did not deter Sakuya. He attacked again, but the doctor blocked his blade with the small cursed sword, breaking Sakuya's sword in two. At this point, the doctor taunted him, saying that Astley would be disappointed if he could see Sakuya now. This led Sakuya to question the doctor about his relationship with Astley, asking if they had been working together from the start. The doctor denied this, explaining that he had heard about a boy who had a history with Sakuya. He decided to cast a mind manipulation spell on Astley, which would gradually make Astley despise Sakuya. The doctor revealed that he had taken every precaution to kidnap the princess in order to remove her demon sword, a process that took him years. He continued to provide checkups and treatment for the princess at the mansion, taking his time to ensure that the princess's cursed sword was no longer in danger of going out of control. In response, Sakuya drew the demon sword within him, determined to defeat the doctor, regardless of the risk of losing control. The doctor then used his cursed sword to put Sakuya in a trance where the princess was dead. This caused Sakuya to kneel in defeat, and the doctor prepared to finish off the manipulated Sakuya. The doctor, wielding his cursed sword, attempts to rewrite the world. Sakuya finds himself on a battlefield, wondering if the scene before him is a creation of the cursed sword. He is looking at a scene from a thousand years ago, a battlefield from the time of the great disaster where most of the Shigur clan was killed. He realizes that he has been transported back in time, leading him to understand that the doctor's cursed sword has the power to create wandering ghosts and a world of nightmares for others. The nightmare that the sword has thrust upon Sakuya is one in which his family died by his hand. He tries to stay calm, reminding himself that he has already moved past these events. However, one of his brothers attacks him in the nightmare. As he fights his brother, he eventually cuts him down. His father, carrying his brother in his arms, steps forward and asks Sakuya why he had to kill his brother. This terrifies Sakuya, leaving him unsure of what to do in his nightmare. Meanwhile, the doctor sips his wine and muses to himself that both he and Sakuya are possessed by a demon sword. He acknowledges that even though they are the victims, a battle between primordial swordsmen and a lost demon sword is still a very interesting story. He expresses his curiosity to see every detail, stating that the past or killing one's own people is something he has to extract from Sakuya until he is dead. In the nightmare he was experiencing, Sakuya was seen responding to his father. He explained that wielding the power of the primordial sword, which is beyond human capacity, comes at a price. If a person takes up the primordial sword lightly, the power of the sword will consume their mind. The sword will then start to wreak havoc and run amok. To prevent this uncontrollable rampage, one must possess a unique mentality, or else they will have to use their willpower, like a sword, to restrain it. On the day of the great disaster, Sakuya was confronted by a family that had been consumed by a demon sword. He had no other choice but to kill them. His father retorted, accusing him of being heartless. He pointed out that Sakuya, despite being skilled in combat and swordsmanship, was unable to control himself. He chose to kill his family, forgetting that they were his kin. His father argued that it was unjust for only Sakuya to continue living, and he scornfully called him a bastard. The doctor, sitting on his chair with his wine, laughed as he watched Sakuya struggle with the nightmare. He commented that the evil dream is a cursed magic sword ability that cuts deep into the psyche. It is more than just a curse. Since Sakuya had already witnessed the death of the princess, it meant that Sakuya was already at his limit and his death was imminent. Back in Sakuya's nightmare, his family continued to torment him. They labeled him a battle freak who killed all of them without even looking back to take care of their bodies because he was so engrossed in fighting. His mother added that it would have been better if Sakuya had never been born. She called him a failure and blamed him for the death of the entire family. The whole family disowned him in the nightmare, which broke his heart 
and he was on the verge of defeat. The doctor, observing this, thought to himself that it was over for Shigure Sakuya. However, a loud voice snapped Sakuya out of his nightmare. The voice claimed to be Sakuya's family. Looking around, Sakuya realized that this voice belonged to Iris. He was relieved to see her after waking from the horrible nightmare. He held her hand to confirm its reality, and he could feel her warmth. At this, the doctor was furious. He muttered to himself that he should have taken care of the princess before she had the chance to interfere in his world of nightmares. Iris, aware that the doctor could see her, decided to use the world of nightmares that the doctor had created against him. She wielded her power of the White Sword of Death and began to rewrite the doctor's world. This is the power of the princess's cursed sword. The scene opens with Iris telling the doctor that he had created a monster and she would be using her magic to her advantage. We see Sakuya talking about how Iris was using her power to rewrite the doctor's original. Sakuya was stunned as he experienced the power of the princess's magic sword, the power of the white sword of death, the power that remembers the deaths in the past, the present, and the future. Sakuya wonders if the correct death was projected onto the world and if time will rewind. Sakuya could hear everyone's feelings now as a decapitated body heads towards him, chanting how she didn't want to die now saying how she didn't want to leave Sakuya alone yet. Her words juggled Sakuya's memories as he recalled a scene where he saw two bodies, two people he had known were part of his family in their final moment. He witnessed how one wondered how it was that they were leaving the mortal world without being able to help Sakuya accomplish part of his goals. The other responded by saying that Sakuya alone was to bear his fate and how they didn't resent him or hold any grudges against him, even though they wished they had lived longer to support him. Sakuya found himself utterly taken aback by the turn of events. For so long, he he had carried the weight of believing his family held grudges against him for their untimely passing. He had thought that they resented him for being the kazu of their passing, and now he was moved knowing their initial thought of him. He was lost in thoughts, wondering if he could finally be free of the guilt he had carried over and over again. Iris approached him with unexpected reassurance, telling him that the scene he was witnessing is just precisely as it had happened, indicating that any perceived grievances were merely misunderstandings. She gently reminded him that his absence during their final moments had likely contributed to this misconception so he should let it go and forgive himself as it wasn't his fault. Neither does his family ever thought what they went through was his fault. Amid this revelation, Sakuya turned to Iris, a mixture of confusion and curiosity evident on his face. He couldn't help but wonder who she was and whether she had known him all along. With a gorgeous smile playing on her lips, Iris casually hinted at the fact that she was well knowledgeable about Sakuya's past, teasing him with the promise of revealing more once her current mission was completed. As she gracefully turned away and disappeared from sight, she offered a half-hearted apology with her powers for any inconveniences she had caused him, a subtle reminder of her mysterious nature. As Iris's presence faded into the ether, Sakuya found himself enveloped in the echo of his master's voice, a spectral reminder of his past training. Her words dripped with a bittersweet regret as she reminisced on how she had failed by training him to be the strongest sword instead of an ordinary boy who went to school, made friends, got tangled in drama, and even had a girlfriend. In a tone laced with both concern and acceptance, she confessed her enduring desire for Sakuya to lead a remarkable and benevolent life, even in the aftermath of the disastrous events that had unfolded. Yet, beneath her seemingly optimistic wish lay a firm acceptance of the inevitable, a recognition that fate's tangled web would eventually find him and trap him despite her best efforts to shield him from harm. With a flicker of reluctance, she then bestowed upon him his ultimate task to finish what she and his family had started before they met their demise, a burden heavy with significance and responsibility. Despite their collective failure to eradicate all the ancient, world-altering primordial swords, she deemed Sakuya worthy of inheriting this weighty mantle. As the sole surviving person of their lineage and the epitome of strength, the mission now rested squarely on his shoulders. Sakuya stood dumbfounded as he digested all that had just happened right in front of him. Just as she was dying, she made a confession that she had the power to glimpse into the future, and she left him the revelation that she possessed the ability to glimpse into the murky depths of the future. Such foresight had eluded his understanding until this moment, shattering his preconceived notions of her limitations and leaving him in a position of worship with a newfound sense of awe and trepidation for his master. He watched as she passed on and stated that he was still no match for his master. He was happy and wished she would be his teacher again, if he ever had the chance to meet her again, but he felt his words didn't reach her. But as he turned to leave, she called out to him, stating that he had forgotten something. She passed on the primordial sword to him, and it was announced that he had retrieved the sword. After dealing with his family, who had become wandering ghosts and setting them free, he came back to reality with the demon sword held firmly in his hands. He remembered all his teacher's teachings. He called out to the doctor and said he wouldn't 
didn't ever drop his sword again as he slashed multiple times towards the doctor. The doctor was scared as Sakuya was trying to rewrite his original. With an air of disbelief at all the events unfolding right in front of him, the doctor lunged forward to attack him in a fit of rage, only to witness the wandering ghosts dissipate into thin air, leaving him shocked and momentarily off balance. Meanwhile, Sakuya's mind drifted back to a simpler era, a time when the world revolved solely around the art of swordsmanship, devoid of the mystic energies that now permeated their reality, such as magic and magic swords, as he took his stance to attack the doctor. Drawing upon his ancestral techniques, Sakuya tightened his grip on his blade and assumed a resolute stance, channeling the ancient wisdom of his lineage. With a defiant cry, he invoked the time-honored enchantment of his clan. Original release, Star-Lord, unleashing the latent power of his swordmanship. With each deliberate step forward, Sakuya embarked upon his unwavering advance, a testament to his unmovable resolve and unyielding determination. No obstacle could deter him from his path, for he was a force of nature propelled by the singular conviction to persevere against all odds and called out to the sword he was wielding. Sakuya moves forward as he states that he will always push forward. In the tense standoff between Sakuya and the doctor, each poised for combat, the doctor found himself fidgeting with a question stuck in his mind. Why couldn't he wield the cursed sword or tap into his magic? Sakuya stepped forward and stated that all powers were nullified within his created space. So no matter the magic weapon or the magical abilities his opponent wields, it's all useless in his domain. With just that one move, he closed the space between him and the doctor. He showed him the true power of the release of the Star Lord. The clash between the two of them created a big splash. The doctor was shocked and asked if Sakuya was planning to end this with just a sword fight. Sakuya assures him that they would settle it all within this space as nothing more than swordsmen. Within the space, they could only use their swords, precisely what they would use. The sword clash between the two men started like that, with the doctor feeling overwhelmed by Sakuya's actions. Sakuya raided the primordial sword at the hands of the doctors to be of a different caliber from his, but the wielder was just worse. Sakuya was optimistic about winning the battle, as his short sword granted him more blows against the doctor's long sword in proximity. Despite his best efforts, Sakuya found himself unable to match the careful movement movements of the doctor, frustrated by the strategic positioning of his adversary's sword. Determined not to be outmaneuvered, Sakuya resolved to increase his speed, a decision made in the heat of the moment. With a burst of newfound speed, Sakuya surged forward, seizing the opportunity to snatch the hat worn precariously atop the doctor's head. In a triumphant proclamation, Sakuya declared the end of their confrontation, his voice ringing out with a mix of confidence and bravado. Suddenly, a strange sensation coursed through the doctor's arms, a sensation foreign and unsettling. Before he could comprehend the source of this inexplicable tingling, a swift and decisive slash from Sakuya's blade sliced through the air, severing the doctor's arms from his body with startling precision. The doctor became frantic as he was feeling the fear, desperation, and hunger to live as the match continued. He picked up the sword with his mouth and thanked Sakuya, as he had always wanted to feel what it was like to be scared. The feelings he was feeling right now made him so happy as all they had was just a sword, and both were fighting with the desire to live. Still, the doctor felt too bad as he wanted to experience many more horrors. He had already lost against Sakuya, as the sheath of the primordial sword had protected Sakuya against the deadly attack. Sakuya was a bit stunned as the lunatic confirmed to him that he had summoned the sheath. Sakuya took a different stance as he prepared to deal the final blow. The doctor was so happy as he wanted to feel the perfect terror, and the aggressive technique was about to do just that. He wanted to experience the same fear his mother felt when she saw him. He was so excited just at the right moment that Sakuya delivered the final blow. His excitement turned into confusion as he thought it would hurt or itch as he just got cut off, but it didn't. He wondered if this was how fear felt. With a hint of regret in his voice, Sakuya extended an apology to the doctor, his words laced with a touch of irony as he reflected on the potential bond they could have shared if things had gone differently. Expressing his disappointment, Sakuya elaborated on the technique he had employed, a skill passed down through generations of his family that effectively nullified any physical sensations, rendering pain and fear obsolete in the heat of battle. Addressing the doctor directly, Sakuya lamented the unfortunate outcome, highlighting the doctor's approaching demise without ever experiencing the very emotions he had longed to feel. Despite the briefness of their interaction, Sakuya expressed a sense of contentment for the fleeting companionship they had shared, a sentiment delivered with a comical twist. In response to Sakuya's unexpected revelation, the doctor's frustration boiled to the surface, his anger palpable as he dealt with the realization that his desires would remain forever unfulfilled. This chapter starts with the doctor as a kid as he ventured into the forest to get honey from a beehive. As 
As he was stung by the bees, he felt nothing. His mother, witnessing this scene, says that he is crazy, but he reassured her that he wasn't, and he was just born without the ability to feel anything. Driven by an unwavering sense of fearlessness and unyielding optimism, the doctor's childhood seemed to be filled with moments where he intentionally put himself in situations that would have killed someone else, yet he consistently defied the odds. Despite facing countless brushes with death, he emerged unscathed time and time again, a testament to his indomitable spirit. While his mother would watch him with a face filled with complex emotions that he couldn't understand. Fueled by an insatiable curiosity to explore the depths of human emotion, the doctor embarked on a journey into the realm of medicine, specifically psychiatry, in a quest to unravel the source of fear. Determined not to let his existence be in vain, he set his sights on a peculiar endeavor, to subject himself to a psychiatric spell, yearning to experience firsthand the intense sensation of fear that had eluded him thus far. With each step he took into the intricate maze of the human mind, the doctor sought to unlock the secrets of his own psyche, driven by an insatiable hunger to comprehend the full spectrum of human emotion, even if it meant traversing the darkest recesses of his own consciousness. The result was a failure, and as a result of using himself as a guinea pig for his experiments, his mind and body became unstable. During his quest for this spell, he stumbled upon the gift of the devil, the short cursed magic sword. He understood the power of the sword immediately. He held the sword, a sword with the ability to create and stack nightmares. He became ecstatic as he imagined a future where he stacked enough nightmares and finally used it upon himself. He would finally be able to experience fear. His desires were the reasons he was after the princess's magic. He, however, came across Sakuya in his quest, which led to his unfulfilled demise. The cursed dream sword was finally secured. Iris walks in with her guard. She calls on Sakuya to go home with her. At her home, she finally decided to tell him the truth. He stated that he had seen Iris's corpse and his family as wandering ghosts. She informed him that that was just the doctor's evil plan, and she was just in a room beside his. As Sakuya observed Iris, he couldn't shake the feeling that there was something different about her aura, a subtle shift that tugged at his curiosity. Yet ever the enigma, Iris brushed off his observation with a calm reassurance, insisting that her demeanor remained unchanged. With a casual wave of her hand, she encouraged Sakuya to stop with formalities, inviting him to converse with her in a manner devoid of honorifics. Amazed by her sudden informality, Sakuya found himself both intrigued and encouraged. He was finally free from the constraints of customary politeness. Seizing the opportunity, he finally brought up the question that had been eating away at his thoughts, eager to unravel the mysteries that shrouded Iris in an aura of intrigue. He asked her if she had known who he was since the beginning with the power of the cursed sword. She acknowledged that and summoned a sword, the Sword of Death, and informed him about how the sword could see through past, present, and future deaths. That was how she knew about him, as the sword had predicted his transition, and she had to act alone. She agreed that she couldn't see everything as she tried to look more into him, but couldn't see it. She wanted to know why and how he would be good to be her bodyguard. She talked about how she had foreseen a lot of it, and how she got kidnapped on purpose to take advantage of the clinic warding. She explained how it was essential for Sakuya's demon sword to set things up with the doctor and how they had to unleash the original. In that moment of revelation, Sakuya's mind became a whirlwind of comprehension as Iris's cryptic words began to unravel before him like a tightly coiled scroll, how the warding was used to cover off the effects of the primordial sword, and how Iris had to use the clinic warding as she had no time. She told him no one knew about the battle as she didn't want to reveal too much information, especially against the Knights of the Order of Rose. She reached for him and said, she had something to show him. She showed him a future she had recently predicted about how, three years from now, the human race will be destroyed by a natural disaster caused by the Knights of Rose. Sakuya was so stunned by this unexpected future that seeks to wipe all of humanity off the face of Earth. Sakuya was still trying to digest this new vision that he saw, a future with no humanity because of the actions of the Knights of the Order of Rose. Iris doesn't know why they would do that either, but all that was certain was that it would happen and occur in three years. Sakuya still couldn't believe leave his eyes, and said it couldn't be possible as six of the demon-cursed swords had been destroyed, and there would be no way to replicate the natural disaster. With an air of calm revelation, Iris revealed a startling truth that seemed to defy logic, yet somehow made perfect sense in the twisted games of their reality. She painted a picture of a world where the very instruments of the knights, those cursed magic swords were being harnessed not as an instrument of peace, but rather as unwitting accomplices in a grand design of forthcoming natural calamity. In her explanation, the notion of magic swords 
Alliance took on two significant roles, serving not only as tools of formidable power, but also as pawns in a more giant game of manipulation. The unsuspecting wielders, she believed with a firm resolve, were mere unknowing instruments for the machinations of forces far beyond their comprehension. And as she spoke of the proliferation of these enchanted blades, one couldn't help but marvel at the irony of it all. For in a world where magic and menace coexisted in precarious harmony, the line between salvation and destruction blurred into a maze of sinister intrigue. The kingdom and the knights are in cohort with this and would be discarding everyone once they are no longer helpful to them to achieve their aim. She said she wouldn't allow this and had to do something about it. Sakuya recalls the scene when Iris was cast out and disgraced. She informed him that the knights were gathering materials to find the ancient swords, so it was a race against time for them. She said she couldn't make any flashy moves to attract the attention of the people they were against, as she was the disgraced holy princess and a lot of eyes were scrutinizing her. And that was why she wanted Sakuya to be her sword once again and help her go after the swords to prevent the extinction of the human race. She instructed him that from now on, he would no longer be a shield to her, but a shining sword on stage. With an exaggerated sigh that could rival a dramatic stage actor, Sakuya seemed to play his part to perfection, as if the weight of the world rested solely upon his shoulders. Iris interpreted this as him being tired of helping her. She quickly assured him of her continued financial compensation in order to win him over. In a comically theatrical gesture, he raised his hand as if to protest, saying that that wasn't his intention and that she had it all wrong. One could almost picture the invisible eye roll as Sakuya's laughter rang out, punctuated by the unmistakable sound of relief his words dripping with sarcasm disguised as jest, as he reluctantly accepted her quest for him as he would not only be protecting her, he would be protecting the world. And as he obliged to her request with a smile on his face, as he knelt down to reach for her hands, one couldn't help but chuckle at the irony of it all. For in a world where alliances were forged amidst the looming threat of disaster, Sakuya's reluctant connection with Iris seemed like a plot straight out of an absurd comedy. She thanked him and asked him to stand up as she had a favor to ask him. She wanted him to hold her until morning. The following day, a boy called Carl stomped into the palace and was looking for Sakuya as he yelled that Sakuya tied him up. As they opened the door to the room, the attendant and Carl were greeted by the sight of Iris and Sakuya sleeping next to each other. The scene stunned Carl, and Carl's abrupt departure from the scene left the attendant who had escorted him to the room feeling surprised, like a character in a sitcom suddenly finding himself in a serious drama. As the commotion settled, Sakuya jolted awake, his mind racing to catch up with the abrupt shift in the atmosphere. The weight of someone on him reminded reminded him of the events from the previous night, like a hazy dream slowly coming into focus. His startled reaction startled Iris awake, as if she, too, had been caught in the whirlwind of confusion that surrounded them. She woke up and started rambling about how none of their lives was guaranteed, as the power of the primordial sword was limited, and she couldn't see it all. She asked if it was all right for her to want to live, and he answered that it wasn't his place to decide that, and that he also felt the same. He said he was glad to be reunited with her, especially during the nightmare. Hearing this, she hurriedly hugged him. She tells him how glad she was to have met him. The chapter opens with the sight of the academy. We see a group of boys discussing how it's been a while since they have been to the academy as the school was closed down due to the situation with the wandering ghost. They saw Iris wave to them. Sakuya was surprised about how happy she was today and asked if something good had happened to her, which she responded by saying, of course, because she was glad they got rid of the wandering ghosts, saving the other students. He compliments her and tells her how much she has changed since they met and how she looks alive these days. In a calm tone, she murmured words of gratitude towards Sakuya, attaining how the changes was due to Sakuya, and how he had brought light into her once dark story, though her remarks went unheard amidst the noise of their surroundings. She urges him not to lose focus, reminding him of their school mission, emphasizing the importance of achieving the coveted S-rank. The impending battle against the Knights of the Order of Rose loomed large as they might be coming into contact with them soon in the search for the ancient swords, casting a shadow of urgency over their endeavors. With determination in her voice, she stressed the significance of his success in attaining the S-rank, knowing full well that it would shape the course of their future battles. If he can inherit the sword and achieve S rank, he will become a knight of the Order of Rose and have more in-depth knowledge of his enemies. He was well aware of this and knew they would have to go this route. She talked about how the Order of Rose would soon stand against the kingdom. As they engaged in conversation, a skinny figure approached them with an air of self-importance, demanding an audience with Sakuya. It was Astley, the same individual whose antics had caused a stir during the recent encounter with the wandering ghost. With mock sincerity, Astley offered a half-hearted apology for the disturbance he had caused, attempting to downplay the severity of his actions. He expressed gratitude for their assistance when he had succumbed to fear and passed out, a gesture tinged with insincerity. Dismissing the need for forgiveness with a casual wave of his hand, he wandered off, leaving behind an aura of self-assurance. The boys stood 
stood by, utterly surprised, as they witnessed Carl seemingly reconcile with Iris and Sakuya, which was so unlike him, they saw him with his head bowed and were shocked about his actions. However, Iris encouraged Sakuya to take pride in himself, unaware of the sinister plot brewing beneath the surface. Meanwhile, Ashley's lips curled into a malicious grin, a facade masking his true intentions. In the depths of his mind, he concocted a devious scheme aimed at undermining the trust between Iris and Sakuya. Ashley imagined the perfect opportunity to exact revenge for the humiliations he had endured at Sakuya's hands, plotting to use social manipulation as his weapon of choice. Though Ashley openly admitted that he paled in comparison to Sakuya's prowess with a sword, he remained determined to tarnish Sakuya's reputation through cunning and deceit. The next scene is students training at the square. Walton complimented the first set for not slacking off and asked who wanted to go next. Ashley raised his hands, asking to go next, and decided to challenge Sakuya while he was lost in thoughts about how fake Walton's smile was as he saw him in the vision as one of the ones who caused the disaster. Walton thought to himself how Ashley was trying to wash away the humiliation of the mock battle they had previously. Ashley throws a wooden sword at Sakuya, asking him to have another severe one-on-one -on -one with him. As the confrontation between Carl Ashley and Sakuya Shigur unfolded, Sakuya wasted no time in launching his offensive attacks. This prompted a smirk to creep across Ashley's face, enjoying what he perceived as Sakuya's oversight as he had moved way too fast without examining the sword in his hands. In Ashley's mind, he chuckled at Sakuya's apparent ignorance of the delicate balance between their blades. With a mere tug on the invisible thread binding their swords, Ashley believed he could effortlessly disarm Sakuya, thereby subjecting him to public embarrassment. The sweet anticipation of humiliating his adversary danced in Ashley's thoughts like an irresistible melody. He imagined how this action would be like killing two birds with a stone, humiliating Sakuya for what he did to him and restoring his reputation. Sakuya kept attacking frantically, while victory thoughts still occupied Ashley with his new device plan. He finally decided to attack by pulling the thread, but to his surprise, the sword didn't budge, and from Sakuya's POV, he thought someone had imbued the sword with magic as the sword was trying to move on its own. They both stopped momentarily, and Ashley was stunned by Sakuya's reflexes as he reacted before the sword could leave his hands. Sakuya's irritation became apparent at the thought that someone had the audacity of meddling with the carefully arranged battlefield Ashley had planned. Little did he know that suspecting others was wrong, and that Ashley was the architect of this chaos himself. In his refusal not to succumb to defeat, Ashley opted for a bold move, enhancing his physical capabilities by using body enhancement. With determination etched on his face, Ashley grasped the invisible thread, intending to manipulate the situation to his advantage. However, much to his dismay and to Sakuya's concealed confusion, the thread snapped under the pressure of Ashley's manipulation. The unexpected breakage sent Ashley stumbling backward, his sword swinging wildly and landing with an unfortunate precision on Waltron's crotch. This made everyone at the square gasp. Isn't it funny how Ashley's schemes are backfiring? Noticing the situation, he began to apologize to Walton for his mistakes. Walton accepted his apologies, and Sakuya thought to complete the duel, but Ashley refused. Walton canceled the match, called it a day, and told them the werewolf was just an urban legend. Sakuya carefully observed Walton. He thought of how fake his smile was as he treated everyone so well, but Sakuya couldn't see him the same way anymore. The night of the full moon, a lady was running as she kept on saying to herself that it was just a lie and the werewolf didn't exist. It was just an urban legend and more. She soon fell as she ran. Her legs suddenly gave out, and she came face to face with the werewolf boy holding a chainsaw that had recently cut his legs as he talked about how pain is what makes life real. The scene unfolds with a grand castle looming in the background, its imposing silhouette casting a shadow over the courtyard. Enter Cynthia, a figure of loyalty and dedication, bowing before a regal lady who seems to hold court from her elevated seat. With a tone that borders on frustration, the lady inquires about their progress in apprehending the elusive wielder of the cursed magic sword and the outsider. Cynthia, ever the dutiful servant, offers her apologies for their lack of success thus far, citing the cunning of their quarry. She explains how their efforts have been consistently not amounting to anything because of the elusive nature of their target, likening the situation to attempting to catch a sly wolf that effortlessly navigates through the most heavily guarded territories. The irony of a castle full of guards being outwitted by a lone rogue. One can almost hear the frustration in Cynthia's voice as she recounts their futile attempts to trap their prey, painting a vivid picture of a cat and mouse chase where the mouse always seems to be one step ahead. Iris mentioned how disappointed she was since Cynthia had made a 
lot of noise about how she could catch it, yet the wild animal remained uncaught. Cynthia asks for more time, which the royal agrees to, stating that she has faith in Cynthia's abilities and persistence as she never leaves a job undone. This comment excited Cynthia as she promised to make sure she hunted down the cursed magic sword wielder and the outsider and purified them also under the authority of her phosphorescence of justice. Cynthia bid her farewell, but the princess sensed something, and just as she was about to pull out her sword, Madoka appeared from the shadow to stop her and remind her about exhausting her life source. After a brief conversation, the princess decided to leave for Castro's. The scene opens with the beautiful sight of a different mansion as we see them chatting about how she enjoyed the S-rank mission and was a bit tired, but the trip was worth it, even though she missed school. The boy suddenly remembered that Iris had wanted to tell him something when they were at school and asked her about it. She told him that the once-in-a-year festival would be held soon and they would participate in the competition. Iris informs him that if he does well in the competition, he will be close to the S-rank that he had always dreamed of. He asks what the competition is about, and he informs him that it is a competition where the two academies send representatives to compete in three games, with the first being the flag game, where the one who picks up the flag is the winner, and the second being the broom game. Picture this, contestants wielding their brooms imbued with magical powers with the finesse of master craftsmen, each spell cast with the precision where magic dances through the air like graceful birds in flight. It's a veritable showcase of magical prowess, where control is crucial and one wrong move could spell disaster. And then, finally, the knight game. Here, the noble knights, clad in their shimmering armor and wielding swords crackling with magical energy, face off in a battle of magical supremacy. It's a showdown of epic proportions, where the essence of their magical abilities is tested. The collative results then decide upon the final winner. They both wondered which game he would be assigned to, but the decision was up to their director and academy. She informs him that if he is labeled the man of the match, he will be given the Holy Cross, which would benefit him significantly as the cross has the power to amplify his magic power. Although the cross is a replica, it is still as good as the original. She informs him that the cross would be suitable for her, as she exhausts a lot of her magic power trying to control the cursed magic sword, and she would love to have one right away. A rumor has been circulating in the town that on the night of every full moon, a werewolf appears, and anyone who comes across it is done for, but no marks are left on their bodies except their face, forever stilled in pain. Werewolf Boy made his resolve known as he wanted the cross. The scene opens with a girl questioning why a specific person would be allowed to participate in the tournament again this year. The guy tells her that the absolute king would partake in two of the matches, and for one of the matches, he would be his opponent. She worries about him because even when Katrina fought, they lost against the absolute king the last time. He called everyone in to announce the players. Sakuya was nervous and excited, while Iris was excited. The man announces Monica as the representative for the broomstick game. Sakuya and Katrina were announced as representatives for the flag game. Iris and Sakuya were quite surprised, but quickly became optimistic and thought of another idea idea for them to win the cross. Katrina came in at that moment and went over to Sakuya, stating how she had recently been discharged and how glad she was that they were on the same team. Sakuya recalls a glimpse of the future that Iris showed him where the Order of Rose was causing disasters, but Katrina wasn't a part of that, so he thought it would be perfect to become friends with her. Just as the discussion ended, someone walked in, stating that it wouldn't be right to let an F-rank knight take part in the flag game, and asked His Highness to rethink that decision. The presence of this person caused everyone's attention to move towards him. The ones who recognized him were quickly stunned and started to stutter his name, the Grim Reaper. He introduced himself as Hades, the Grim Reaper, and asked to participate in the flag game. This suggestion brought a smile to the prince's face. Iris was stunned when the prince introduced the Grim Reaper as Narcissus, the ghost member of the Academy. She explained how the Grim Reaper is believed to be even more substantial than the Absolute King, and how he had transferred from the other Academy to theirs. The prince asked Hades what he could do, as he only knew the legend, and hadn't experienced his skills yet. Seeing that they doubted his abilities, he challenged Sakuya to a duel. This excited everyone around as they began to chant to witness the skills of the Grim Reaper. Iris was hesitant as she didn't want Sakuya to reveal his trump cards yet. Sakuya found the situation bothersome as he declared that he accepted the duel, and Hades was glad he got Sakuya's attention and asked him to get dressed and see him tomorrow at the arena. Hades reminded him not to forget his magic sword, but Sakuya had no idea what he meant. Hades felt happy as he walked away, stating that Sakuya's defeat had been written on stone. We see a lady excited about how the sword she recently made is perfect in preparation for the forthcoming competition. However, However, she contemplated making it lighter as it might be too heavy. The chapter closes with the scene of students gathered around a square. The scene opens with the department president acting as the referee, and the rules of the game are according to the knight's game rules. Iris 
was scared about the battle and was fidgeting when the referee called for the duel to start. Neither of them moved for a while as they were being cautious. Hades finally made the first move and attacked with an ice magic spell. The spell resulted in a gigantic tower shooting cannons while Hades was on top, laughing at how he had already won since Sakuya didn't have any magic. However, Sakuya was motivated and decided that even though his attacks couldn't reach Hades up, he would have to bring down the tower. He went for the tower, but his sword crumbled as he hit it with his sword. This stunned everyone as they realized Hades had used body enhancement, which meant he had researched Saguya before the battle. They thought this was cheating and started accusing him of being a piece of shit who had picked up victories via manipulative ways. Hades, however, thought they were being naive as the act of warfare was information, and knowing your opponent makes you a step ahead of them. He thought of how winning this duel would make him not come in contact with whom he called the monster the absolute king wouldn't appear in the competition. Just as he was celebrating his victory, Glenn came into the square and passed on the new sword she made to Saguya, stating that one was allowed a spare sword in the competition. Saguya caught the sword but felt that it was heavy. She informed him it was custom made just as he had commissioned her to make it, but it was just in the prototype stage, and she wanted him to try it out for her. He got in position and was ready to attack the tower. Hades laughed, stating how the sword would only end up breaking. Saguya, with the sword, felt he could do it, so Hades decided to reinforce the tower's body enhancement. He felt the feeling of comfort, and he moved towards the tower and decided to attack. As the sword came in contact with the tower, it divided it like it was slicing bread, and he decided to call it Kiyami, with Saguya announced as the winner, and people discussing how Saguya would have been ranked if he could use magic. Saguya went to thank Glenn as she couldn't have without her help. This display sent Hades into a meltdown. Seeing this, the president felt it would only be suitable for him to give up on fighting the absolute king and let Saguya do it instead. But he refused the idea as he felt they were things he needed to prove by fighting the battle himself. At Elagon, the capital of Dunchy Force, a group of friends were playing on the street before mistakenly hitting a man who immediately glared at them, demanding which body part they would love to lose, sending shivers down the spines of the innocent girls. The creepy man, however, decided to leave it at that and went his way. The ladies felt like they were causing trouble for him, as they kept ending up amid unwanted drama, but the boy Louis assured them that he enjoyed their company and was prepared to protect them anytime. He puts the leech on the girls. They get on their knees and start crawling on the street as he instructs them to head home to Fredo. He had killed the man who glared at the ladies earlier. The chapter opens with the captain of the Third Order of the Royal Magic Knights of Fredel having a chainsaw just inches away from her neck while she looks scared and drained. The entire city searched for her as she had always been exceptional and had guards watching her. Just around the corner, she was with the werewolf boy from the earlier chapter with a chainsaw across her neck in case she moved or screamed. He is excited that the army in the city is looking for him, but he claims he doesn't have enough energy to fight them now. She is still trying to move, but is unsure of the magic he has used on her. She tried to use her most potent magic to attack him while he turned his back to her, but to her surprise, he quickly deflected it and slashed her neck while she was still wondering why her most potent magic couldn't even scratch him. He called onto his sword Lord Grivelin to feast on her, and he would have to get the cross to help him. Someone witnessed all this unfold, but the werewolf guy didn't know. At the other academy, we can see them all training so hard for the competition. They were all happy with their progress, but Monica was still finding it hard to fly and was covered in bruises. She refused to stop and continued practicing even when they urged her to stop. She got the hang of it, but went too high. And as she looked back down, noticing how high she had gone, she panicked and lost control and plunged downwards. But Sakuya was able to catch her. Sakuga asked her why she was chosen for the broom game, and she told him it was because she got good grades on her broom game test during the entrance exam. She assures him she is getting the hang of it again as she hasn't ridden it in a long while. Monica decided she had had enough for the day and would head home. A strange shape appeared in the training ground, surprising everyone.